In today's module, we will be discussing about the role of neuromonitoring in spine surgery. Why neuromonitoring is very important? We all know that spine surgery is quite uh, risky and the risks involved is quite high. So, whenever we are operating especially susceptible patients like cervical myelopathy or when we operate uh, on deformity patients, spinal deformities like scoliosis or kyphosis, the chances of injury to the spinal cord is there. And uh, we have to know whether the spinal cord is getting injured or not when we are operating because once the spinal cord gets injured because of one reason or the other, it is very difficult for it to come back to its normalcy. So, intraoperative neuromonitoring has gained significance in the past decade and it is very important to know what it is and when it has to be used. So, as discussed in the earlier slide, it is a valuable technique for assessing the nervous system and it replaces the neurologic examination when the patient is under general anesthesia and cannot cooperate with the face-to-face -face examination. Before the advent of neuromonitoring, we were using something called a Stagnaros wake-up test. So, here the patient will be counseled by the operating surgeon and the anesthetist before the surgery in the pre-operatively that they will be waken up during this procedure to know whether the neurology is intact or not and they have to cooperate. But uh, the patient's extubation will not be very smooth and waking up the patient during the midst of the procedure is not very smooth and the patient also will not have a smooth intraoperative and immediate postoperative period. So, it replaces this kind of uh, hurdles that we were facing and it assesses many neural structures including the neuromuscular junction, peripheral nerve, spinal cord, brainstem as well as cortex during the surgery. So, what are the types of neuromonitoring? The first and foremost is the motor evoked potential. It could be spinal or transcranial or neurogenic motor evoked potential. It could be somatosensory evoked potentials which is commonly called as SSEPs. It could be electromyography which again can be spontaneous EMG or triggered EMG or it could be F waves and H reflex. Of these, MEPs and SSEPs are the commonly used ones during surgeries. So, before going to that, we all know that this is the corticospinal tract and here you can see at the level of medulla or pyramid, it divides into the lateral and the anterior, 80% of the fibers pass laterally and 20% passes uh, anteriorly and this tract is otherwise called as the motor tract or the corticospinal tract or the pyramidal tract and it is responsible for the impulses to travel from the brain to the spinal cord through the spinal nerves to the muscles. So, let us take this is the brain and this yellow structure is the spinal cord. So, what happens in a normal individual is when you are applying a stimulus, when you are applying a single pulse through a stimulator to the brain, normally we can record what is called as a direct wave and indirect wave when you place an electrode in the spinal cord. So, the D is the direct wave, the impulse is directly seen in the spinal cord and the rest of the waves are called as indirect waves. And when you place an electrode in the muscle, you will be getting something called as muscle MEPs. So, this is very important to understand. However, under anesthesia, when you are giving a single pulse to the brain, because the patient is under anesthesia and when you place an electrode in the epidural space, only the direct wave will be recorded, the indirect waves will not be recorded and no waves or no signal will be recorded when an electrode is placed at the muscular level. However, when multiple train of stimuli or multiple pulses are given to the stimulator at the level of brain, then you will record multiple direct waves through an epidural electrode and you will be able to record muscle MEPs when an electrode is placed in the muscles. So, this is the basis to understand the motor evoked potentials. So, let us see one by one. The spinal MEPs or D wave, a single transcranial electrical stimulation of an intensity of about 80 to 100 milliampere and duration of about 0.5 to 1 millisecond with a frequency of about 0.5 to 2 hertz can be recorded from the epidural or subdural space of the spinal cord. It involves no synaptic activity. It is the stimulus is being applied at the brain. It travels down to the spinal cord and you are recording directly from the spinal cord. What is the warning sign? 
if there is a decrease of the direct wave amplitude of more than 50 percent of the baseline before commencing any procedure we have to do something called as baseline recording so after positioning of the patient before even incising we will record all the type of waves and we will see what is the baseline value and any reduction in the baseline value of less than 50 percent it is considered significant however we are not using d wave very commonly because placing an intrathecal or epidural electrode it is uh, quite cumbersome and we are not using the d waves routinely the commonly used method of neuromonitoring is transcranial myogenic mep as i already said the impulse travels down from the brain to the spinal cord to the anterior horn of the spinal cord but single stimulus usually there will not be any response but however when there is a train of stimuli multiple stimuli this response will be picked up by the muscles and the electrodes in the muscles that is called as the transcranial myogenic MEP.